Hi everyone. In today's video, I will take up an example to try and explain how you can investigate the cause and effect relationship in research studies. To do so, I'll just uh, use an article I was reading in a magazine the other day, which mentioned that uh, eating fish increases IQ of children. So the story reported on the latest research that found that children who eat fish at least once a week have higher IQ than their non fish eating peers. So let's see how we can turn this into a cause and effect relationship study in research and think about the uh, design or the methodological design you will need to decide on. So the fish and the get smart headlines was of course the story but as I read more I found that the study actually looked at children's IQ and compared them to a number of factors which included uh, diet, education, socioeconomic status, age of the parents, parental marital status and their education level and some more things. As one of the correlations they found that was between eating fish and IQ. So as fish consumption rose so to the intelligence. But then again, you could say is that uh, did the intelligence rise because of more fish consumption or do more smart people eat more fish? So the correlation was not a cause and effect. So an experiment needs to be designed to investigate this aspect of the relationship between eating fish and enhancement of IQ in children. So because an intervening or confounding variable might also come into play. Maybe it's not the fish that makes you smart. Maybe what's going on is that the smart parents feed their children fish and their children's IQ is determined by genetics. So need to get to the bottom of it. So you need to design a methodological study which will involve some kind of an initial planning. So let's see what factors will come into play in the initial planning. The first thing you have to think about is what will be the dependent and independent variables in this research study. You need to identify the main focus of your study or what you are trying to assess, which will become the dependent variable as well as the variable you will manipulate in order to cause an effect that will be the independent variable. So in this case, you are hypothesizing that IQ depends on fish consumption. Therefore, IQ will become the dependent variable and fish consumption will become the independent variable that you can manipulate. You know, you can increase or decrease the fish consumption. That part you can manipulate, you can change. You can't increase or decrease the IQ. So this identification of variables by type is central to moving from a correlation to a cause and effect relationship study. The second thing you will think about is the assessment of change. So in order to determine whether the manipulation of your independent variable has affected your dependent variable, you will need to be able to assess that change. So the most effective way to do this is by both pre and post testing, which in real world context may mean collecting or having access to good baseline data and being able to collect comparable data after the experimented intervention. So maybe somebody has already done a baseline study, so you can use that, uh, but that should be for the same research participants. Remember that or you can do your own pre testing and post testing. So in this case, assessing change is relatively straightforward and it will involve administering standard IQ tests. So you can you can conduct a standard I, standardized IQ test for a group of children who will be agreed to participate in the research. Note down their IQ before you start on them on the uh, fish diet. The third thing you have to think about is the research setting. Consider whether you will be conducting your study in a controlled environment such as a laboratory or if you will use a natural setting. Now in this case, a lab may give you total control, but as is the case for many real world problems, it may not be very practical. Um, so other options in this scenario will be to ask parents to vary diets at home or to make arrangements with maybe a daycare center to change the weekly menu, something like that, because having the children in a controlled environment in a laboratory and having them eat what you want them um, may be plausible, but it's difficult to achieve, especially with underage, I mean, like with young children. Then think about the number of participants you will use, which will be very crucial because think about the participants or how many participants will be necessary 
for you to make any kind of conclusive or statistically significant judgment. So are five children enough, 10, 15, 20? What will give you a, a, a finding that will be generalizable to other contexts as well? Think about the number of groups. So you will have to decide if you will use a control group or not. So in this example, using a single group would involve testing the IQ of all the children, feeding all of them fish a set number of times a week, and then testing them at some period thereafter to see what happens. With a control group, you would test all of the children at the start, put half the children in a control group and the other half in a target group or treatment group, and only give fish to the children in the treatment group. You would then test both groups again at a later date and then compare the findings. If you are using a control group, you will need to determine how you will assign your groups. Will children be randomly selected for fish consumption or will you use different criteria for selection? While randomization will provide you with stronger cause and effect arguments, you might find it more practical to select children based on, for example, on the, num on the days of the week they are in a daycare center because then you will have easier access to the children and you will be able to use them for the experimental study. Think about the other variables. Will you just test one independent variable or will you test for others as well? For example, will you simply look at fish consumption or there are other aspects of children's diet you will want to explore such as vegetable intake or meat intake or something like that. Ethics, of course, is a very integral part of every research study. So you have to consider whether you will need informed consent or not. You, of course, need informed consent. In this case, of course, you will need parental consent because you will be involved with young children. You will also need to consider if there are any advantages or potential threats to the group members based on their inclusion in either the control group or the treatment group. Now, while there may not be high risk associated in eating or not eating fish, issues of equity represent a huge ethical dilemma in drug trials, treatment programs and educational initiatives. Especially there could be objection from the parents. Finally, you need to consider how you will negotiate the balance between the practicalities of working in real world situations and the need to control the environment. You need to consider how you can ensure your findings can be attributed to a true cause and effect relationship between your independent and dependent variable. Now, the more controls you embed into your experimental design, the more convincing your arguments will be. Let me explain by example. Without these controls, arguments can be spurious or it can be questioned by the examiners or reviewers. Now, exam imagine without a controlled environment, it will be hard to ensure that the only variable that has been changed, shifted or manipulated or introduced is your particular independent variable. For example, other dietary changes, changes in sleep patterns, personal stress, etc. may be happening outside your experimental design as well. Without adequate numbers, it will be hard to show statistical significance or that results are more than a coincidence or that whether you can generalize these results to other contexts or not. Without a control group, it's hard to ensure that there is some other factor that might account for changes in your treatment or dependent variable. For example, that improvement in IQ scores cannot be attributed to things like additional attention that the children might be receiving, practice in taking the IQ test, or the coincidental commencement of a new educational program. Finally, without a random assignment strategy, which is often impractical in real world research, you will need to argue the difference between the two groups are non-existence or at least minimal. In this case, if there is an innate difference in the learning abilities of the two groups, it would be impossible to attribute increased IQ to dietary habits. So you cannot say that I selected the smarter students uh, and fed them fish and then I saw that the IQ has increased. No, you have to probably select students randomly. You cannot uh, you know, have purposeful sampling here. You have to select them randomly um, then initially test them out and then divide them randomly into treatment and control groups. Feed one group fish while the other is not on a fish diet and then test them again. In short, the bottom line in human-centered real-world experiment is always a trade-off. There are always trade-offs. The benefit of the real-world context need to be weighed up against the benefits of a controlled environment. So uh, I think people who want to go on and conduct experiment should think about the trade-off 
and uh, remember to control um, you know think about controlling the environment the more you control the better your arguments will be uh, the objective here is to try your best to show that a certain effect is causing a cause so the change in the independent variable is causing the change in the dependent variable thank you for watching this video guys and i i hope that you like these short and engaging videos which helps you in your research journey let me know what you want to see next. Bye for now.